Turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. I have been wanting to teach this sermon for two weeks now. 1 John chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 13. As we continue our study in the little epistle of 1 John, in a message I'm calling the Holy Spirit's Witness. 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 13. If you have your Bible, turn there. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we commit this time to you. Lord, we pray that you would prepare our hearts. Lord, I pray for the person who, again, lives a life of doubt, of struggle. Lord, I pray for the person who experiences an ever-present sense of dread instead of joy, that their life isn't marked by abundance, but their life is marked by a lack. And so, Heavenly Father, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will speak to people's hearts and circumstances. Lord, I pray that you would remind them of your love, of your deep compassion, and Lord, of your willingness to save, forgive, and reconcile us because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And so again, Father, we commit this time to you. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we have, that we have fellowship with you and with the Son and with each other. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 6, it says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one, and there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. In this chapter, John speaks of some of the wonderful consequences for those who continue in fellowship with the Father and with each other. We love the brethren in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 5. We experience victory over the world in verses 4 through 5. Now John moves from victory over the world in verses 4 through 5 to the subject of what we might call verification of Christ's credentials in verses 6 through 12. And we'll include a note about the assurance of eternal life in verse 13. So John's going to appeal to the witness or the testimony of the Holy Spirit concerning both the Son and the saints and the Scripture in verse 6. Now remember, the Christian in 1 John is given a series of tests. 
Throughout our study in the book of 1 John, there's been a moral test. And there has, which is righteousness, a social test of love, a doctrinal test of truth. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth. And in this text, it's even stronger that the Holy Spirit is truth. The word witness appears many times in the scripture, but from verse 6 to verse 13, it appears some nine times, at least in some form or another in the passage. John is making reference to the Holy Spirit's testimony concerning Christ's ministry, but John will also offer the Spirit's testimony concerning the saints and the scriptures. In the Old Testament, the law required the testimony of two or three witnesses in order to establish every fact or pr prove every assertion. So John is going to offer the Spirit's testimony. And also, Jesus doesn't rely simply on his own claims. Although, if there were no other testimony, it would still be true. But the Father gives direct testimony at Christ's baptism in Matthew 3.17, at the transfiguration in Matthew 17.5, at the resurrection in John chapter 5, verse 31. So the witness of John the Baptist in John 5, 33 through 35. So there's a series of witnesses that are given. The witness of, John, of the Father, the witness of John the Baptist in John 5.33, his own works in John 5.36, the scriptures in, in John 5.39, Moses in John 5.45. So there's this multitude of attestation or testimony concerning the reality of who Jesus is. And so it begins concerning the Son in verse 6. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit who bears witness because the spirit is truth. So what does this strange verse mean? What does it mean to come by water and blood? There are several answers that have been offered. Some believe the water is a reference to the baptism of Jesus and the inauguration of his ministry and the testimony of both father and son. You'll remember when Jesus goes to be baptized, John the Baptist says, I, you sh I should be baptized by you. You shouldn't be baptized by me. And he says, let's do this to fulfill all righteousness. And you'll remember the father speaks and the Holy Spirit comes from heaven. And, he, and when the Father speaks, he attests to the identity and the mission of Jesus. This is my beloved Son. Some believe the water is a reference to the baptism of Jesus, the inauguration of his testimony. Some suggest that the blood refers to the culmination of his ministry, his death on the cross. Another answer that has been offered is John's testimony concerning the crucifixion of Jesus. You'll remember in the New Testament when they are getting ready to break his legs. They've already broken the bones of both of the thieves who are on either side of Jesus. And they're getting ready to break his bones. But they notice that he's already dead. And they take a pilum, which is a brass possibly iron spear point that's attached to a pole, this leaf-shaped spear point would have been maybe six to eight inches long attached to a long pole. It would have been slipped under, under his rib cage. It would have pierced the percardium sac. And John testifies in his gospel that water and blood come from his body. The spear doesn't just pierce the percardium sac, it pierces his heart. And so in the first century, you have to understand why would John say this? Why is this even necessary to say? 
because there were a lot of false claims being made about the identity of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus and the death of Jesus. There were those people who suggested that he didn't really die. And the same John who writes this epistle is the same John who writes the gospel and he says, no, a real Jesus dies in space and in time and reality. The Bible teaches that God becomes a man and he dies a real death. That the self-existent God of the universe acquires a second nature, a human nature. A nature that becomes a part of him. So Jesus is one person with two natures now, forever. And he really dies. And so for the person who says, well, did God die on the cross? You can't kill God. A self-existent being can't die. Did Jesus die on the cross? Of course he did. Remember the Bible teaches that again, he is human in every way. So moderns didn't invent this idea of the swoon theory. Back in the first century, it was already circulating that, hey, guess what? Dead people don't come back to life. And so he probably didn't really die. Even in the ancient world, there were those who asserted that Jesus didn't die on the cross. And John's testimony from both the gospel and the epistle is no, he really does die. Some of the Gnostic teachers taught this strange notion. It was the, the notion that this Christ's spirit came upon Jesus at his baptism and then left him at the cross. And by the way, this is a notion that is embraced by many of the mind science cults that exist even to this day. And mysticism and, and new age people will suggest that Jesus was the Christ in the sense that he is the anointed spirit that comes upon Jesus and then leaves Jesus. But all of that is nonsense because the reason why it's nonsense that John is saying is they're asserting that Jesus isn't a real savior. Now, I, I want you to think about this because it's very important. There are different people who have different views about the problem of humanity. The Bible's assertion is that the real problem of humanity is that they're sinners in need of a savior. The vast majority of people who live on this planet believe that the problem is ignorance. And if you have the right information, then you'll be fine. Think about that for just a moment. If the real problem is ignorance, and you have the right information, and then they say, we'll give you the right information so that you'll be fine. But it doesn't deal with the sin problem. It doesn't satisfy the sin problem. And so that was part of the reason I think that this little epistle is written. It's in order to address this issue. John tells us that Jesus is declared by the Father to be the Son of God, by the Holy Spirit to be the Son of God at his baptism in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, that he's proved to be the Son of God on the cross in John chapter 8, verse 28, in John chapter 12, verse 28 through 33. And so the symbolism of water and blood is going to be a well-known picture for the Jewish person who's reading this, not so much for the Gentile, but the symbolism of water and blood are referred in the Old Testament tabernacle. You'll remember, those of you who are familiar with the Old Testament and the Old Testament tabernacle, there was a brazen altar where they kept the blood. There was a laver where they kept the water, which becomes a picture of the word. And so this brazen altar, blood, this laver of water, cleansing, become a type and a picture in the Jewish mind of sacrifice and cleansing. And so Jesus comes by water, cleansing, and by blood, sacrifice. The Lord Jesus himself is our cleansing from sin, and John's testimony in this epistle is, oh, that's true. That's what's true. And that's why at the end of the text it says, and it is the Spirit who bears witness. 
Now, let's pause for just a moment and think about the relationship of the Holy Spirit to Jesus. The Holy Spirit's ministry is focused on Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people who think that the Holy Spirit is the forgotten person of the Trinity who is, seems to always be left out. People pray to the Father in the name of the Son. People pray to the Father and people laud Jesus. And, and somehow the Holy Spirit feels left out of all of this. And nothing could be further from the truth. The Holy Spirit, without exception, his ministry has always been to point people to Jesus, to declare Jesus, to exalt Jesus. In John chapter 16, verses 13 and 14, we read, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he won't speak on his own authority, but whatever he bear, hears, he'll speak, and he'll tell you the things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. The purpose, the, the Holy Spirit points people to Jesus and elevates Jesus and lifts up the name and the message and the sacrifice of Jesus. In John 16, 8, it says, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me of, of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. And Jesus says, I have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them right now. And so Jesus reveals that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is going to support, encourage, exalt, elevate Jesus. And so when you are in a church or you're hearing people say stuff and they go, oh, and they do weird things, they go, oh, that was the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm here to tell you something. The Holy Spirit isn't weird. When I got saved, when I first became a Christian, literally the very first Sunday after I became a Christian, I visited a church. I was born, raised, and educated Roman Catholic. I'd never been to a Protestant church before. And so you can imagine it was a very kind of scary experience for me. I had never been to a Protestant church. You know, in the church that I grew up in, you know, it's very, it was very, very familiar. So I'm, I'm sitting in this church and all of a sudden people start yelling and screaming and, and saying stuff that I've never heard before. And I, I, I said to the person next to me, what, what's going on? And they said, that's the Holy Spirit. Now, again, I'm a brand new Christian just out of the chute. I don't know anything about anything. But I know what's happening doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem right. And you, throughout the years, people have tried to say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit will make you bark like a dog or, or judo chop the air or run up and down the aisle or, or spit or scream or swing from the chandeliers. And by, by the way, if the fruit of the Spirit is the same as the character of Christ, in your reading of the New Testament, does Jesus ever seem weird to you? No. And so the Holy Spirit is also not weird. The Holy Spirit's ministry focuses on Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit bears witness that Jesus is the Christ through the written word of God. Warren Wearsby in his excellent expository outlines writes, quote, the entire Godhead agrees that Jesus is the Christ. And on earth, the spirit, the word, water, the cross, blood, bear the same witness. God is witnessing to the world that this is his son, yet people will not believe. They receive the witness of men, but they reject the witness of God, unquote. And throughout our study, I've tried to help you understand what a witness is. Remember, a witness is a person who has a knowledge of the facts. A witness is a person who has a reputation for honesty. A witness is a person who has the ability and willingness to tell the truth. And so when the Bible says a witness, it incorporates all of that idea. A person who understands what's happening, 
a person who has a reputation for honesty, a person who's willing to communicate the truth. And so the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And the Holy Spirit is incapable of telling a lie. Mortimer Adler, who was, of course, the great editor of the Encyclopedia Britannica, did an article on this issue of what is truth or the nature of truth. And he said that truth, in order to be true, has to have two characteristics. It must be incorrigible, which means not subject to perfection. And it must be immutable, which means not subject to change. In other words, for truth to be true, it is not subject to perfection. It is not subject to, to change. Truth, in order to be true, will be true everywhere, every time, to everyone, under every circumstance. And so I've discovered that there's only four things that I can say with absolute certainty is absolutely true. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is not subject to change, not subject to perfection. The Son is not subject to change, not subject to perfection. The Spirit's not subject to change, not subject to perfection. So if those three things are the only things, what, 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 what might the fourth thing be? Everything they say and do. If the Father is true, then everything that the Father says and does will always be true. If the Son is true, then everything that the Son says and does will be true. And this is why John can write that the Spirit is true. Remember what Jesus said? I am the way and the truth and the life. And so, how does the Holy Spirit bear witness? Well, in a twofold manner. By reminding us of his coming and of his cleansing. So the Holy Spirit says, God sent Jesus, his son, to be the satisfying solution to the problem of sin. And so in verse seven, it says, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Most conservative Bible scholars believe that this verse should end with the word witness. So in verse 7 it says, for there are three that bear witness, period. Why is that? The end of verse 7 and all of verse 8 doesn't appear in any ancient Greek manuscript. It does appear in later Latin manuscripts. To my knowledge, they don't appear in any Greek manuscript before the 10th century. And only eight very late Greek manuscripts after 1520. There was a very famous man, his name was Erasmus. And Erasmus basically translated the Latin Vulgate or the Latin Bible into a Greek manuscript, if you will, or in, into a Greek compilation. And Erasmus excluded the end of verse 7 and the end of verse 8 in the first two editions of his Greek New Testament. And when he published it the first time and the second time, he received enormous criticism from the supporters of the Latin Vulgate. And Erasmus said, look, I'll include the verse if one Greek manuscript can be found to contain the verse. In the application Bible commentary, it says, quote, in turn, a manuscript was especially produced to contain the passage. Erasmus kept his promise, included it in the third edition, and from there it became a part of the Textus Receptus, or that's a Latin term for the received text, and hence it was translated into the King James Version and the New King James Version. So you might be thinking, are there other verses like this? Well, you know, there are some variant reading and renderings, but I'm here to tell you something, that this doesn't affect the meaning of the message of First John whatsoever. So the bottom line is, I suspect that the passage is spurious, which means it shouldn't really be there. But again, is the statement itself true? I think that the answer is yes. And so, another compelling reason for the omission 
is it's not quoted by a single church father for the first 500 years of the church. If the verse really existed, it would have provided additional ammunition for the heretics who denied that Jesus is God. By the way, because this passage was inserted, does that mean that Jesus isn't God and that the Trinity isn't true? No, because we can amply prove the reality that the Father is God and that the Son is God and that Jesus is God and we can amply prove that there's one singular God. So that's not what's at issue. And by the way, the, the point of the passage doesn't, the point and the focus of the passage isn't a, a Trinitarian. The point of the passage isn't to prove the Trinity. The point of the passage is to provide insight into the identity and the mission of the Savior and the verification of the Spirit. And so in verse 8, when it says, and there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one, it's a true statement, but it probably isn't part of the inspired scriptures. The scriptures teach that the Father and the Holy Spirit testify to the Son elsewhere in Matthew chapter 3, verses 6 through 17. So we continue concerning the Spirit. Look what it says in verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he's testified of his Son. What John is basically saying is, under normal circumstances, you as a human being accept the testimony of other human beings. In other words, under normal circumstances... If somebody says something is true, you would normally believe them. Now, again, there are exceptions. If a person doesn't know the truth or doesn't have an understanding of the facts or a reputation for honesty, then the chances are you might be very, very skeptical. You probably maybe have even said something to the effect of, you're such a liar. Usually when you say the words, you're such a liar, there's a proven track record of prevarication and not telling the truth. So here in the text, when it says, if we receive the witness of, of men, the word if carries with it the linguistic idea in our culture, of maybe yes, maybe no. But in the Greek language, I think the, the meaning is more likely since we receive the witness of men. The witness of God is greater. That is, if human beings say something that's true, we acknowledge the truth of the statement. We know that human beings are capable of fraud and deceit. Someone once said, people may doubt what you say, but they'll never, or but they will believe exactly what you do. And so John's point why wouldn't you believe the testimony of God? Why wouldn't you? And by the way, there are literally millions of people who don't. They don't believe what the Father says about the Son. Now, the reason why this becomes such an important thing, some of you may have heard of a group of people called the Jehovah's Witnesses. They claim that they have the Father, but they don't have the Son that Jesus is the archangel Michael. John's point is, sorry, Jehovah's Witnesses, if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. In verse 10, it says, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he's not believed in the testimony that God has given us of his Son. So in verse 10, when it says, he who believes in the Son of God, the word belief isn't just simply acknowledging the reality that God sent his son Jesus, but it, it seems to imply a trust, a reliance, a confidence. So there's another witness. Now think about it. If the Holy Spirit is a witness and a credible witness, all of that is true. But then John points out, there is yet another witness. 
Jesus has come into your life. In what sense? Because you love him and you believe him and the Holy Spirit has come inside of you. He's basically asking the question that some of you have asked over and over again. How do I know? How do I know? How do I know that I'm a Christian? My position is, I ought to know. I was there when it happened. Let me give you a silly illustration. How many of you know that you have a driver's license? Many of you. How many of you know you don't have a driver's license? Many of you know that too. Having a driver's license or not having a driver's license is something that you know. How do you know it? If I said, how do I know? Well, you could go, I went to the DMV. I took the test twice. I finally passed it. They gave me this picture. Here it is. It's in my wallet. Now, this is where the illustration breaks down because you can show me a picture of your driver's license. If I said, show me that you're a Christian, how are you going to prove it? John says, you were there when it happened. In other words, did you ever come to a place in your life where you realized that you were a sinner, that Jesus died for you, that you acknowledge the wickedness of your life and God's ability to save you in Christ, and you prayed a prayer of repentance and forgiveness, and you invited Jesus into your life, and he showed up, and you were really changed. This last week, I called the guy who led me to the Lord in the sense of he drove me to a Christian concert at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. Because I, I said, tell me about that day. Tell me what you remember about the day that I received Christ. And we talked about driving down from where we lived in the high desert down to Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa. He talked about all of the questions that I asked him and the responses that he gave. He talked about how angry I was and how I felt trapped and embittered that he tricked me into going to a Christian concert, baiting me with food and cheerleaders. He talked about how we went to dinner because he said, hey, I'll buy you dinner. And dinner was Taco Bell. And so I'm at Taco Bell and across the street is a tent and I'm thinking, I don't like these people. I don't want to be with these people. And he goes, and so you, you, you said, I'm going to go to the bathroom and you went to the bathroom and you never came back. And so we waited for you and we waited for you and we waited for you. And when it came time for the concert to stop, start, we just gave up on you and we decided you were on your own and they went to the concert. And the real truth was, here was my plan. I was going to ditch them and hitchhike back to the desert where I lived so that I would never have to, do, have to deal with these people ever again. But, but the thought of hitchhiking some 90 miles got a little bit intimidating. So I said, oh, I'll go to this stupid Christian concert and I'll, hopefully I'll see them and I'll just get a ride and I'll go home, no harm, no foul. And I hear the gospel. I hear the story of Jesus. I hear the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, his dead friend, and how he brings his dead friend back to life. I hear the story and I hear him say that Jesus is the resurrection and the life and he that believeth in me, even if he were dead yet, would he live? I hear the story about how Jesus takes this dead, rotting corpse and says, Lazarus, come forth. And this dead, rotting corpse comes out of the grave. And I remember distinctly thinking the thought if Jesus can bring a dead man back to life, I wonder if he can bring my dead heart back to life. And I remember the person inviting everyone there to come forward and because Jesus could change my, your dead life. I thought, he must be talking about me. And I went forward and I, and I prayed a prayer. I prayed that God would forgive my sin and that Jesus would come into my heart. And Jesus showed up 
It happened. I was there. Paul in Romans chapter 8 verse 15 says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption when you cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. It was Paul's way of saying that when you enter into a right relationship with God in Christ, something happens inside of you. It is a subjective witness, but it's a witness nonetheless. The believing sinner changed life as weighty proof of the reality of the incarnation. So does the Holy Spirit live inside of you? Charles Spurgeon said, quote, if you have not the spirit of God, Christian worker, remember you stand in somebody else's way. You are a fruitless tree standing where a fruitful, fruitful tree might grow, unquote. The most difficult, I'm going to say impossible, life, absolutely impossible, is to attempt to live the life of a Christian when in fact you're not a Christian. You've never been born again. You've never experienced his love. You've read Bibles. You've gone to church. You've hung out with Christians. But there's been no change inside of you because you've never repented of your sin. You've never asked Jesus into your life. Frederick Nietzsche, who was a committed atheist, said, quote, Show me that you are redeemed and then I will believe in your redeemer, unquote. The problem with Mr. Nietzsche's statement it really isn't true. Poor Mr. Nietzsche remained unconvinced by the word of God. The evidence of the Bible and the evidence of the crucifixion and the evidence of, of the resurrection of Jesus made him unconvinced. And all the Christians he ever met fell just a little bit short of his expectations. J.I. Packer wrote, quote, when confronted by those who on professedly rational grounds take exception to historic Christianity, he must set himself not merely to deplore or denounce them, but to outthink them, unquote. There are people who are going to come into your life for the rest of your life who will give you all the reasons why it's such a stupid, stupid, mindless idea for you to be a Christian, to love Jesus, to walk with Jesus, to submit to Jesus and to obey Jesus. But this is what John is saying. That you have every reason to believe that what the Bible says about Jesus is true. John says the unbeliever accuses God of lying. And that's exactly what happens when a person refuses to believe what God says about his son and his word. You see, I've come to believe that there really is such a thing as a hierarchy of sin. Some of you may disagree with me. You might think that all sin is the same. That whether it's a lie or whether it's murder, that in the end, they're all pretty much the same. But I'm going to suggest to you that they're not the same. That there are some egregious and disgusting things that people can do. But there's one sin that is more malignant, more wicked, more evil, more disgusting more terrible than any other sin. It's the sin of unbelief. It is the one sin that is so profoundly perverse that every other sin seems almost insignificant in relationship to this one sin. The unbeliever makes it abundantly clear that God doesn't know what he says. They deny his character. They deny his revelation. They deny his message. 
They attack his character. They attack his word. They say you can't trust it. They live their lives as if God isn't real. They live their lives as if future accountability and judgment is one big joke. But John writes, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Remember, he's talking about now, not just the witness of John the Baptist, not just the witness of all of the other things that have gone by. This is the witness that God has given us eternal life, not temporary life, not probationary life. And this is the testimony. God is the source. He's the one who's given us eternal life. And again, it's interesting to me that when John uses the term eternal, he isn't just simply talking about some sort of philosophical construct that, that dips into the, into the past and then goes into the future. He's not just simply talking about living forever and ever. He's not just simply talking about that, but it includes that. In John chapter 17, verse 3, John writes, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. When he defines eternal life, he goes, and this is eternal life. You're going to live forever and ever. It's that, but that's not what he says. He says, and this is eternal life, that that you may know God and know Jesus. John defines eternal life, not simply in terms of living forever, but of loving forever and being loved forever. John defines eternal, here's what he's basically saying. God's going to live forever. You're going to live forever because God lives forever. Now, I want you to think this through. John is saying God lives forever and he loves you forever. And because he lives forever and he loves forever, you're going to be a part of forever. And so it can't mean probationary. It can't mean temporary. It can't mean anything other than what it's saying. And note what it says. And this life is in his son. The life isn't found in Calvary Chapel. It isn't found in what I say. It isn't, the source of life isn't religion. The source of life isn't anything other than Jesus. The Bible teaches that God has life in and of himself. There's two categories of beings that exist in the universe. A self-existent being that's not dependent on anyone or anything for life and everything else. This self-existent being, not dependent on anyone else or anything else, imparts life to you. A self-existent being gives you a quality of life that can never end. Everything that has a beginning will have an end. Everything physical will eventually disappear. But this is the assurance of the life in his son. It resides in Jesus. This is the testimony that God has given us life. It's in his son. Jesus makes this a life available to everyone who will love him and trust him and believe him. He's the source of life in John chapter one, verse four. In John 14, six, remember that's what it means when it says he's the way and the truth and the life. This life is in Jesus alone. This is the testimony that the false teachers that John is writing to refuse to believe. What they're suggesting is that there's life Elsewhere, There's life apart from Jesus. There's life apart from his sacrifice. There's life apart from his resurrection. And John says, no, no, no. In verse 12, he who has the son has life. And he who does not have the son doesn't have life. Sorry, Jehovah's Witnesses. Sorry, Muslims. Remember, they don't believe that God has a son or that he sent his son. 
The presence or the absence of Jesus in your life is the evidence that you have life. The absence of Jesus means the absence of life. The presence of Jesus means the presence of life. One Bible writer said, John explained that people gain eternal life through a relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. It's not a payment that anyone can earn or a prize that can be won because, because Christians possess eternal life through a relationship. God made that relationship available by sending his son to earth in human form. People have eternal life, not only as a future hope, but as a present possession. Life into eternity began at the moment of conversion. Why? Because fellowship began. The presence of the Holy Spirit began. And that's why, if you were ever saved, you're forever saved. The big question do you have the Son? Remember what John has just said? He who has the Son has life. It's the most important question that you could ever ask. Do you have the Son? I would ask the question maybe even a little bit differently. Does the Son have you? Do you have Him? Does he have you? And so in verse 13, look what it says. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know, that means with certainty, by the way, that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. John identifies his audience. Read it for yourself. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. That's his audience. The people who believe in the name of the Son of God. He identifies his intention, which is assurance that you may know that you have eternal life. In the Spanish language, there's two words for know. One is saber and conocer. Saber, when you say yo sé, means I know. Conocer means to know because you've experienced it for yourself. Some of you might know that Bill Clinton was a former president of the United States. You know it because you read the newspapers or you read the history books, but I know him because I've met him. I've shook his hand. He's extended his hand to me and he's looked at me and he said, I can't believe this, but you look really familiar to me. Really, Mr. President? Yeah, you look, do I know you? There's just something so familiar about you. You know what I wanted to say to him? Well, we have something in common, Mr. President. Oh, what's that? We're both half white and we're both half trash. But you can't say that. You can't say that to a president. It would be rude and wrong. And so guess what? I didn't say that. I just said, how are you, Mr. President? Whew. James, make sure that the president doesn't see this tape, okay? One means to know with your brain. The other means to know by personal experience. That's the kind of knowledge that he's talking about. He's talking about the assurance that provides fuel for perseverance. Look what it says. That you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So his audience, people who believe. His intention, assurance for the purpose, purpose of perseverance. So how do you know you've been born again? How do you know that you've been born from on high? The saved person believes that Jesus is the Christ. Verses 1 through 5 in the chapter. Verse 13. The saved person loves and obeys God. Verses 2 and 4. The saved person has their prayers answered in verses 14 and 15. The saved person doesn't live in unrepentant Perpetual sin in verses 18 through 21, which we're going to find out next week. The saved person loves God. The saved person believes and embraces a lifestyle of love. Chapter 2, verse 7. Chapter 3, verse 11. Chapter 4, verse 7. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Dr. Robert G. Gromacki in his wonderful book, Salvation is Forever, lists 12 things 
by which we can test the salvation experience. Paul says, examine yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith. He said, test yourselves. He says, don't you know yourselves that Jesus is in you unless indeed you are disqualified, he says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Paul's hope is that you're not disqualified. How do we know that? Because in the very next verse, Paul says, but I trust that you will know, same word, certainty, that we are not disqualified. So what are the 12 things? We're going to put them up real quick. Number one, do, do you enjoy spiritual fellowship with God, with Christ, with fellow believers? If you say, you know, I love God, but Christians are kind of hard to be with, hard to stomach. Do you have a sensitivity to sin? First John chapter one, verse five. Are you obedient to God's word? First John chapter two, verse three. And by obedient to God's word, you know exactly what that means. When God says, do you, I need you to do this. And you go, no, I'm going to do what I want. Do you love the world and its values? Do you love the world and the values that reject God in Christ? 1 John 2.15. Do you love the Lord Jesus and anticipate his coming? 2 Timothy 4.8. 1 Timothy 3.5. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know, we know that when he shall appear, we'll, we're going to be like him. Do you love and long for his appearing? Do you practice sin less now that you've confessed and professed Christ. I'm not talking about are you a perfect person. I'm just saying are you growing and maturing? Are you growing and maturing? Number seven, do you love other believers? 1 John 3, 14. Do you regularly experience answers to your prayers? 1 John 3, 22. Do you have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit inside of your heart? Romans 8, 15. Do you have the ability to discern between spiritual truth and error? John 10, 3. Do you believe the essential doctrines of the faith? 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Have you experienced persecution because of your commitment to Christ? And because of your willingness to honor him and love him and satisfy him rather than somebody else. And if you can truthfully answer yes to some of those questions or most of those questions, I'm going to suggest to you that you're moving in the direction, hopefully, of evidence of change evidence of salvation. This isn't about me judging you. This is about you judging yourself because we're saved by grace through faith and that not of works. Our works testify to the reality of what Jesus has done inside of our life. We are and will forever be saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but it won't remain alone it will leak out into the very real world in which you live. I had a person on my radio program who suggested that most of America believes the gospel. That you don't really have to change your way of thinking or change your way of living. He was the director of the Bonhoeffer Center and he said, Quoted, quoting Bonhoeffer, he said, when, God, when Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. When Jesus says, come and follow me, be my disciple, follow me, go in the direction that I'm going. Unless the seed dies first, it can never produce the plant. And genuine faith will lead to a genuine confession of sin and repentance of sin and a change of heart and a change of life. And so again, if anyone has ever wondered, they should always go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you would know that you have eternal life, not temporary life, not probationary life, not maybe yes, not maybe no, not on again and off again. 
Eternal life by its very nature means it can never come to an end. And now we understand. Eternal life isn't a simple embracing of a list of do's and don'ts and rules and regulation. It is an organic friendship and fellowship relationship with God. And that's the point of this entire book. Next week, we finish our study in 1 John. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Lord, I pray that not only do we have you, but that you have us in our thinking, in our living, in our planning. Lord, we pray that you have us in friendship and fellowship in everything that we say and everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.